Behind this compassionate person lies a dark truth, a reality that goes unnoticed. <laughs> Most people know what empaths are, but if you don't know what they are, I'll give you some key points about empaths. Now, the most common thing that everybody knows is that they're emotionally sensitive, which means they're able to pick up and feel the emotions of other people and experience them as their own emotions. They can easily pick up on subtle cues, body language, and even unspoken thoughts or feelings. This heightened sensitivity allows them to empathize deeply with others and offer genuine support. Now, the thing is, when it comes to that aspect, it's like from a very young age, they learn how to do these things instinctually. They most of the time don't even realize that they're doing it. And so the child learns what emotions are associated with like the body language or actions, and they are able to associate with the energy that's being put out, right? So, for example, if a kid sees someone yelling or, you know, experiences someone yelling at them or around them, it's going to feel different than someone laughing, you know, having fun around them, and they're going to be able to you know, associate those feelings, those emotions, those actions to that energy. Now, once empaths are able to pretty much decipher and decode the energy based off the emotions and stuff, they can then reverse it. Uh, they can now reverse it and feel the energy and just know a person's thoughts and feelings, if that makes sense. I hope it makes sense. Second point, we have intuition and insight. And the intuition and insight, again, comes from knowing that energy, right? Like I said, they decode the, the thoughts, feelings, body language into energy, and then they reverse it, right? That's where the intuition and insight partially comes from. So along with their intuition and insight, they are really great judges of character. And so they can pretty much decipher a person's motives like before they even get to know them, which is very, you know, handy. And also their intuitive abilities will allow them to offer guidance and advice to those that may need it. Which leads into, you know, number three, which is healing and support because they experience people's emotions as if they were their own. They then know and understand what it's like to go through a certain thing. And because of this, it allows them to, well, connect on a deeper level, but because they've experienced their pain, they have the innate ability to provide emotional support, comfort, and solace to those in need. Their compassion and understanding create a safe space for others to express themselves without judgment. Then we have energetic awareness, which kind of like what I said uh, earlier, right? So they are highly attuned to the energy around them. That's because they're able to associate like body cues, body language, all that, and convert it into energy and frequency. And so they're very aware of the energy, but they can sense the positive or negative vibes in a room or even within an individual. This awareness allows them to adapt to their environment, practice self-care, and establish healthy boundaries to protect their own emotional well-being. We're going to get into that. And number five, of course, is deep connection. Like I stated earlier, empaths have the capacity for deep and meaningful connection with others. 
They are often described as being highly empathic, compassionate, and caring. The ability to connect on a profound level can foster a sense of trust and openness in day-to-day relationships. However, with that being said, behind this compassionate person lies a dark truth, a reality that goes unnoticed. What do I mean? Well, the dark truth about empaths, we're going to get into this right now. While it is possible to be empathic naturally without external or environmental influences, that is not the case for many. So don't get me wrong, someone can be born naturally empathic because either they were genetically, you know, made up that way or, you know, it's just a gift. But there can be a much darker side to it. So the thing that many people don't know is that this ability can develop through trauma or what can be perceived trauma in early childhood development. So in other words, becoming and developing empathic tendencies is rooted in trauma. And how, how is that possible? How you might ask? I'll tell you. As a child grows up naturally, instinctively, they are drawn to safety and seek it physically and psychologically and they look for it within their caretakers naturally, right? Like that's normal, that's what, you know, babies and children who can't fend for themselves do. Depending on who you study, many psychologists would agree that safety and love and affection, aka emotional support, are part of the major foundation that creates a healthy child. However, when the child doesn't receive part of that foundation, they must learn how to survive on their own and on their own terms. They subconsciously begin developing a defense mechanism of picking up social cues, which can be stripped down to energy. They can translate body language into emotion, into energetic vibration, and as they develop it further, by translating it backwards into thoughts or the source from which the energy was created in the first place. But why? Why would they do this? If they can learn to decipher social cues, feelings, and energy, they are able to perceive a threat. In this instance, the biggest threat is not obtaining the principal or foundational needs, which can come in the form of abandonment. When a child perceives the threat of abandonment, they are going to have to fulfill that need somewhere or somehow. Well, they come to figure out that by being able to feel a person's emotions, they'll be able to feel the negative ones and perceive any threats that may come about from those emotions. To avoid conflict and or fulfill that safety and emotional support need, they will abandon themselves by projecting energy or by doing or saying things, aka fine-tuning themselves to fit the person. So like, people pleasers? There's a reason, sorry, there's a reason why you are a people pleaser if that's how you are. When you fine-tune yourself to somebody to fit them, Technically, that is a form of manipulation and, you know, that will manipulate the person into a favorable response for you. So think about it. You feel somebody that's in a crappy mood, right? Because you're empathic and you've learned how to decipher energies and stuff, you're going to feel crappy because of that person. So what are you going to do? You're going to fix their emotion so you can feel better. (laughs) I know it's clomp, clomp, y'all, for the new subscribers, I am dyslexic when I speak and when I write and everything. So sometimes I say my words backwards or I say phrases and I jumble them. So sorry, (laughs) I can't do much about it other than edit the crap out of the video. And then that's why it's so choppy sometimes because I can't talk like a normal person. But anyway joking aside because this isn't a joke this isn't a joke you guys this is trauma okay so anyway so when they do that favorable response to get that other person to feel better and it makes them feel better in turn that is a form of manipulation as messed up as that sounds okay so when a person does this right When they're trying to make the other person feel better, 
they pretty much abandon themselves because a lot of times they're going to do things outside of themselves that, you know, they wouldn't want to do or wouldn't necessarily make them happy. It's people pleasing, right? You can only put up a facade for so much until it affects you, unfortunately. And, you know, guys, there is a difference between an empath and a narcissist. The thing with a narcissist is a narcissist doesn't care how you feel. They don't give a crap. Whereas the empath really does care. They are abandoning themselves by doing this. And it goes against their own energy. And again, it chips away at their identity. Whether they know it or not, they develop a give and receive loop where they give their energy with the expectation of a good outcome. I also noticed that many empaths like to overcompensate and attempt to control as many outcomes as possible to keep themselves protected. This is why being an empath can be one of the biggest defense mechanisms yet. Like I always say on my channel and to the clients I help, it is extremely important to work on yourself and work on your traumas, healing as many as you can. Why? Because not only will it raise your vibration, it will aid your spiritual growth, it will aid your personal development, it will also contribute to better health, mental and physical, okay? Then when it comes in terms of negative entities, if you have an attachment or you have a haunting or pretty much negative energy in your space, doesn't belong there. Um, Just understand that. If you remove the trauma, you remove the stressor from yourself, you're putting a spoke in a wheel or slowing down the wheel, the negative energy food wheel that I created, and I'll show you somewhere, where what happens is you have a stressor. Person evokes a negative response because of the stressor which then produces negative energy, which the entity feeds off of that energy. Well, the entity learns that, right? They they understand that the negative energy comes from the negative response and the response comes from the negative stressor. So after the entity feeds off that energy, the entity causes the stressor or a stressor which could be in terms of pretty much rubbing salt into the wound um, or creating a fear response in the person. If they are haunting them, they're gonna create a fear response. So that would be in the form of paranormal activity, nightmares. That could be in the form of making other people combative towards you. Because remember, depending on the negative entity, they can manipulate, they can influence other people and When they do that, they can pretty much get that person or any people to go against you and then it creates conflict. What does conflict do? Creates negative energy. Oh look, it's part of the wheel and it's feeding off of it. So anything that produces negative energy, the negative entity is going to cause that. Hopefully I didn't lose you. I put a copy of this wheel on my Patreon. So guys, if you are interested, it'll be on my Patreon. Okay, anyway, moving on. So the question is this, how do you heal that specific trauma? Like how do we heal that trauma? So you can at least slow down the wheel or, you know, put a spoke in that to keep things from feeding off that energy, but also to heal yourself because, you know, you want to heal yourself. Number one, therapy. And you know what, guys, I have a background in criminology. I have a degree in it. I minored in psychology and while, you know, I am into the paranormal, sometimes paranormal and spirituality doesn't work with psychology. However, there are people out there that are both that can be a medium and a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a therapist, they exist. But there's nothing wrong with therapy. 
therapy is very helpful. But if you have a difficult time looking within yourself for answers and or need help with coming up with a plan of action to aid in healing, seeking a therapist will benefit you, especially one who specializes in trauma and attachment issues. They will also be able to provide you a safe space to explore and process your feelings while offering guidance. Okay, number two, build a support system. One of the main reasons I started this paranormal spirituality channel was because I wanted to build my own community of like-minded people so we could learn together and share share our experiences because you know what when you're somebody who experiences a haunting and you have nobody because everyone in your family thinks you're you're looney tunes um it gets rough not gonna lie my parents my parents, my dad didn't really believe in this stuff. My mom was just like, okay, well, I'm here, but, like, she doesn't really care for the paranormal stuff. Like, it doesn't interest her, which is fine. Everyone has their own interests. But it's, like, not having that support system at home was rough. So I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm gonna make my own support system. And ta-da! Anyway... But yeah, so surround yourself with understanding and non-judgmental people that share your experiences and emotions that can provide you with empathy and validation because you do need that while you're healing. Not gonna lie. Number three, three, practice self-compassion. Be kind to yourself and recognize that healing takes time. Engage in self-care activities that bring you joy and makes you feel nurtured. This will also raise your vibration, as I said, you know, earlier. This includes hobbies, exercise, meditation, or spending time in nature, aka grounding yourself. Number four, challenge negative beliefs. Abandonment trauma, or any kind of trauma, can lead to negative self-beliefs. Depression, self-doubt, you know, stuff like that. Working with a therapist or practicing self-reflection can help you identify and challenge these beliefs. Replace them with positive and empowering thoughts that promotes self-worth and resilience. So your positive affirmations, they are very helpful in this technique here. So it's like you stand in a mirror and you say all these compliments about yourself. You can do that. Um, You can write it down. Honestly, writing stuff down is very powerful. Number five, explore inner child healing. Abandonment or any type of trauma can leave lasting imprints on your inner child. Engage in inner child healing exercises such as writing letters to yourself, your younger self. Visualizations or creative expression can help you connect and nurture that wounded part of yourself. Number six, very important, okay? Set boundaries, set boundaries, and practice healthy relationships. Practice healthy relationships. Learning to set healthy boundaries and engage in relationships that are supportive and trustworthy is crucial. That's why I said it a bunch of times. Anyway, surround yourself with people who respect and value you and let go of relationships that perpetuate feelings of abandonment, neglect, or anything negative for that matter. If that person doesn't allow you to grow, succeed, or hold you back in any way, it's time to say, bye Felicia. If you feel uncomfortable with something, speak up. Don't do a certain thing because it makes the other person happy and you miserable. Don't abandon your sense of self. Obviously, when you're in a relationship with a significant other, like a love interest, you have to learn to compromise. However, a healthy relationship, there's give and take, and compromise means, you know, you meet in the middle. That's, I'm not talking about compromise. It's very good to compromise. But I'm just saying, like, let's say your, I don't know, your friend loves to go camping and wants you to go camping and they always ask you to go camping and you do and then when you want to do something they don't they don't do it ever that is what i mean there is no balance relationships should be like a tennis match there should be a give and take energy 
So now that you know the dark side of empaths, look within yourself and ask if this sounds familiar, like a defense mechanism you've learned subconsciously or consciously to get any of your basic needs met. If the answer is yes, then you and I, my friend, have something in common and we must work and integrate that trauma together. So honestly, the whole reason, I honestly didn't have this video planned because I thought clairsentience was me, was, you know, close enough, right? It's not the same though. Clairsentience and being an empath is not the same. Empaths can turn into um, clairsentient people and clairsentient people are pretty much almost always empaths, but not all empaths are clairsentient. So, you know, keep that in mind. But the reason I wanted to do this video is because, and I didn't even have this one planned in the lineup actually. So this is an extra one. So you'll probably have an extra day or two of video content. But the reason I did this video was because, I don't know, it just hit me one day. I'm like, dude, this is a defense mechanism. So I was like, shit, man. Um, we got to talk about this. Anyway, so do what works best for you. I personally like to do meditation and self-reflection. That's just what I do because I have a psychology background. I'm able to do this on myself. But if you can't do, like, if you can't do it with yourself, it's okay to find another source like a therapist. So guys, hopefully this helped you. But anyway, I hope you guys like this video. If you have any thoughts, questions, concerns, leave them down below in the comment section. And I will see you tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah. So if you really like these types of videos about mediumship, I highly recommend watching the clairsentience video. And when you do that, you'll know the difference between clairsentience and being an empath. And yes, there is a difference.